All right. So last class, we talked about chemical formulas a little bit. We talked about uh, different kinds of compounds, uh, molecular ionic compounds. Uh, let's see. We had the periodic table to help us. Um, do you remember how to separate the metals from the nonmetals? Where's the separating line for that? The green uh, staircase? Yeah, a green staircase. Yeah. And yeah. which side are our nonmetals? The right side? Yeah, the right side here are our nonmetals. So a compound that only contains nonmetals, do you remember what we call that? Uh, yeah, the compound. The ionic. Well, the ionic one is the one that contains a metal oh, and a nonmetal. That's right. But molecular. I'm Very sorry. good. Very good. Molecular compound is a compound that only contains nonmetals. Good. So um, we did a, a few other things also last class. Um, now we're going to talk about um, a few more concepts and then we'll do some exercises to make sure we can count, do our, our counting of atoms because that's kind of important. But the first thing I want to introduce to you is this uh, concept or idea of what we call hydrates. Hydrate. Now, I think the term hydrate is probably something you can think about and, and know what, what it's referring to. It's talking about having water with the compounds. And we have some materials, uh, specifically ionic compounds, some ionic compounds, that are very good at absorbing water from the surroundings. Um, sometimes you buy food like dried seafood or whatever um, can of dried beans, and they have a little packet inside that has some material that is, we might, you might be familiar with the term desiccant. Desiccants are uh, ionic compounds that absorb water from the surroundings. And those are included in food packets to help the food uh, prevent bacterial growth. Bacteria has a hard time growing without any water, so you can help things stay fresh if you can keep them really dry by absorbing all the water. Unfortunately, this is also what some chemicals will do. Ionic compounds, not all of them, but many of them are, uh, and the property uh, that means they absorb water is hydroscopic hydroscopic, kind of like scopic, uh, kind of like scraping or just scavenging water from wherever it can find it from the atmosphere. And uh, th this becomes a problem because if I have a container of uh, a chemical, let's say I have this chemical up here that we had on the slide, copper sulfate, CuSO4, and I keep the lid on because maybe I know it's hydroscopic and I don't want any water to uh, absorb to the copper sulfate because then as you weigh out the copper sulfate on your, your balance or whatever, um, you might find that some of the what you've weighed out isn't actually copper sulfate, right? So if I put some on this balance and I think, oh, I've got one gram of it, right? I might find out uh, some of it was actually water that had absorbed to the surface. Right, So every time you open the lid, more water will come and stick to the surface of your material, making it, you know, it, it increases the mass of the material because now the mass is not just copper sulfate, it's also some water molecules on there. And so when you weigh it out, you're not weighing out pure copper sulfate, you're weighing out some water as well. And when you don't know how much water you've weighed out, it can become uh, difficult to use to, to find that chemical useful if you need to be precise about exact about how much you're weighing out. So um, oftentimes when you buy these ionic compounds, they'll come as hydrates, hydrates. And the chemical formula is provided like this, where you have the ionic chemical, ionic, ionic compound. This is copper sulfate. But then there will be a big dot with a number and then uh, the water molecule, right? So it's basically saying this is copper sulfate that I have in the container, but for every copper sulfate unit, there's five water molecules. And this is called uh, 
a hydrate. Now, you can have uh, anhydrous without water molecules or compounds like copper sulfate all by itself. You can also take copper sulfate, heat it up, and drive off all the water. And so then you're just left with anhydrous copper sulfate. But we have to be familiar with when we're provided a chemical formula in the hydrated form like this, we need to be able to do the, the counting of the number of atoms of material as well. So let's, let's try this. All right. So if I have, um, let's do this compound, magnesium sulfate. And let's say I have dihydrate. All right. And you know, the, the, the prefix or the number here will tell you whether you say mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, those numbers. And we'll go over those numbers later on when we're naming compounds. But this would be a dihydrate because for every unit of this magnesium sulfate, there's two water molecules. So we need to be able to identify the different elements that are in this compound here. And, um, what do we got, Walt? Well, what are our different elements that we have in this compound? We got Mg. What is that? Do you know? Magnesium. Yeah. So we got Mg. What else do we got? Uh, sulfur. Sulfur. Yep. Yeah. Sulfur. sulfur. Uh, oxygen. Oxygen. And then, uh, are you pointing to the H2O? There's just the hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen. hydrogen, right? Okay. So we have, yeah. even though hydrogen's not in this portion right here, for right. this statement here, you have to recognize that you have magnesium, sulfur, some oxygen here and here, and then the hydrogen from here. So in there, we have these different elements. Now, how many magnesiums are in this statement here, Walt? How many magnesiums are there in this one statement? Can you see that? Um, yeah, one. One. Good. How about sulfurs? A one. One. Good. Now, how about oxygen? This is a little tricky. Uh, five. So you got four here. And one oh, for this. Two. Yeah. So, yeah. so how many so else? Six. six. Very good. Now, how about hydrogens? Four. Four. Four hydrogens. Very good. So. Again, it becomes important for us to be able to recognize the number of atoms or a number of the different elements that are in a given compound. Now, if I am given a, a statement like this, so here is um, iron nitrate. All right. Now there's there's two nitrates. That means for every iron atom. And then I'm going to say a, a trihydrate. And I'm going to put in front here a, a three, meaning I have three of not just this, not just this, but three of the whole thing. All right. Oh, okay. So now let's go through the, the, the steps again. We, there's lots of things we have to think about. But uh, I can see that we have some iron. We have some nitrogen, some oxygen, and some hydrogen. Now we want to find out how many we have, again, in this statement, remembering that that coefficient is for the whole thing. So how many irons do we have? Three. Three, good. Nitrogen? Uh, nine. Let's see. Oh, here. I'm sorry. Three. We have the nitrogen here, and then we have this two for... Oh, I for the, those the, those so parentheses. We're looking at six. Yeah, that's right. Two here, and then three of those two. Very good. Now oxygen. Here's the hard one, right? Yeah. Uh, on the okay, eighteen and then three twenty-one. Is that right? Let's see. We got three here. Three here, right? And then two of those three. Is that six? Six. Yeah. And then. Seven, eight, nine for these three, right? Oh, I see. And then you multiply. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we got 27, right? Okay. 
Am I right? How about hydrogens? Okay. Uh, so we have six and then eight. Eight and eighteen. Okay. Very good. Eighteen hydrogens. All right. So that becomes important because uh, later on, when we're balancing equations, we need to be able to recognize that this number, which is called the coefficient, and I think we talked about that last time, didn't we? The coefficient yes. a little bit? Okay, excellent. When it's in front of a hydrate, it's in front of the whole statement there. Okay, very good. Excellent job. Now, here we have a practice page. We'll practice this. We'll go through this and see if we can figure out how many of these different elements. You're a pro already, but we'll do this anyways. What do you think? For this first one, which is sodium carbonate, how many sodiums do I have? Well, can you see uh, the, just, the two here? Oh, sodium, the whole thing, yeah. So uh, that's sodium, so we have, I guess, two. Yeah, two, Na2. And then we have the C, carbon, oxygen, three. So how many carbons do we have? Uh, just one. Good. So we got two sodiums, one carbon, and how many oxygen? Uh, three. Three. Very good. Excellent. How about this next one? Nitrogen? How many nitrogen do we have? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking. Uh, just one. Well, wait. I did see that little two out there. Uh, two? Yeah, two nitrogen. Good. And then uh, eight helium? Eight hydrogen. H is hydrogen. Good. I mean, H hydrogen, yes. Very good. How about sulfurs? Uh, just one. Yep. And then four oxygen. Okay, excellent. Couple more to go. Okay. Uh, three. Uh huh. Magnesium. Three, three magnesium. Good. Um. So we have two. Uh, Phosphorus. Is it potassium? Phosphorus. P is oh, for phosphorus. Phosphorus, okay. Excellent. Three, two. And then uh, eight oxygen. Eight oxygen. All right, very good. And then our last one here. Okay, so uh, is that copper? Uh huh. CU? That's copper. Very good. Okay, so one copper. Yeah. Uh, sodium is one. That's sulfur. One sulfur. Good. Or sulfur. Okay. Good job. Um, ox oxygen would be five. Five? Is that all? Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, I did see that. Okay. Uh, nine. Nine. Very good. And hydrogen? Uh, five. Five. Ten. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. Excellent. Way to go. Good job. Okay. So. Again, we'll get a lot of practice doing that because whenever we have any information, um, it's pertinent that we can figure out how many specific atoms uh, of the different kinds of elements we're dealing with. All right. So we have also a different way to kind of classify matter. Classify matter. We've talked about how uh, we could divide all of our compounds into molecular and ionic, right? And we talked about how uh, our um, uh, elements are separate from compounds, right? Another way to think about it, and this is um, also, also a useful way to kind of classify materials, is to separate all matter, which is everything, into either pure substances or uh, mixtures, mixtures. Now, let's talk about what we mean when we talk about pure substances. Because pure substances, uh, you know, elements, they're pure because they're all the same element. But compounds are also considered pure substances. So let's talk about that really quick. Some people might say, yeah, I can, I can see how gold, AU, a ring of gold, right? It's all gold, so that's a pure substance. And I can see how you could say I have a, a balloon full of oxygen gas. So 
that must be a pure substance, right? Because it's all the same element. But if I have a beaker full of water, is that a pure substance? It has hydrogen and oxygen in it. But yes, it is, it is also a pure substance. All of these are example of pure substances. So, elements by themselves, or even any compound, as long as all of the material in that container are the same compound. All right, so these are all examples of, of pure substances. Now, um, can I stop you for a second? Absolutely. You said it's as long as all of them are all of them, all of the the molecules or units in there, whatever your your container is or your um, um, your system, whatever you're talking about, as long as they're all the same, the same. So if it's H two O, if everything in there is H two O, then it's uh, a pure substance. If I have a container here and it has lots of different elements, kinds of elements, it has carbon, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and then nitrogen, right? And then some sulfur. But as long as everything in there has this exact same chemical formula, then this can still be a pure substance. All okay. right? Now, if I have a pure substance like water, and here's my container of water, and then I put some, let's say some uh, sugar into the water, right? Now the sugar is floating around, dissolved in the water, so I cannot say anymore that this is a pure substance. The sugar by itself is a pure substance. The water was a pure substance, but now it's a, it's a mixture of sugar and water. All right. So we can either classify materials, matter as pure substances or mixtures, pure substances or mixtures. Um, some example, or, and then mixtures is further classified into homogeneous or heterogeneous mixtures. Homo meaning same. Hetero meaning different. And when we talk about same and different, what we're talking about is uh, the mixture's distribution. <coughs> Excuse me. The concentration of the different components. So here is our... So, yeah, go ahead. Um, could you... Okay, so I get the concept from your drawing. Now, could you go ahead and write that on the side that... The, uh, it would be H2O plus H2O and yeah. C6H12O6. Yeah, could you just write that? Uh, and what do we call it when we write it? That's a mixture. I, right, but I mean, if we, if we were to write it without the drying, we would write H2O plus. Oh, uh, well, we wouldn't really do that. We wouldn't really do that. We would just say it's a mixture of water and sugar, or H2O and C6H12O6, that sort of thing. So we don't have a specific way that we would write that. We would just say, um, I have a mixture of H2O and C6H12O6. So that's how you would make that well, sort of a statement. Well, I was, I was going to say... Uh... If we saw that written out as a in a chemical formula, yeah, yeah, uh, then the product the product would be the mixture. Yeah, right. And um, that, every... that's not actually okay. that's not actually a chemical reaction. We're just combining oh. two things together. Oh yeah, that's right. I, okay, there's a difference between. Chemical mixture. Chemical I mean, reaction. Chemical, uh, yeah. Reaction, yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what this homogeneous and heterogeneous refers to. So homogeneous, um, if I had, again, my container of water here, and I put in some sugar, 
and the sugar dissolves. And so I, I stir it up really well. Maybe I taste the, the water, the sugar water right here and find out that there's a certain amount of sugar. Well, if I taste it over here and I taste it over here, if I taste it everywhere and it has the same amount of sugar, then I'll say that that is a homogeneous mixture. All right. So homogeneous, same. What's same about it is that there's the same amount of sugar everywhere I look and the same amount of water to sugar ratio everywhere I look. Whereas a different kind of mixture here, this could be water and I put some sugar in here as well. But in this one, maybe I put way too much. And so some dissolves, but other amount just kind of piles up here on the bottom. And so then I have a pile of my C6H12O6, my sugar on the bottom. This is no longer a homogeneous mixture because up here you have some sugar and water, but down here it's almost all sugar, very little water, right? So it's different. The amount of sugar differs from the top and from the bottom. And so this becomes a heterogeneous mixture. All right. Does that make sense? Homogeneous and heterogeneous, referring to uh, how well they're mixed in together? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. So, some examples. Uh, pure substances. An example of pure substance is, you know, some gold. Just a piece of gold. Right? It's pure. All gold. Here's a, a tablespoon or a little bit of, of salt, let's say. So I got a, a table, um, a pile of salt here. Here is a compound called octane. Octane is a major ingredient in gasoline. So all of these could be considered pure substances. Your salt, your octane, your gold. Compounds? Well, the salt, sodium chloride, NaCl, has more than one kind of element. So it's not just an element. It's a compound. Uh, your, um, your octane, it has carbon and hydrogen. So it's a compound, but your just your little piece of gold there is only has gold atoms, so it would be considered elemental. All right. Let's look at some examples for mixtures. All right. Um, milk. Milk is an example of a mixture. Um, do you happen to know, or do you think you know what the major component, the thing that is most in milk? It's water, right? Water. And I don't oh, you probably okay. say, oh yeah, duh, obviously, yeah. It's mostly water. And I don't know if you've ever milked a cow or remember back in the days when uh you know, obviously we don't probably remember, but we probably remember stories of buying milk and it being delivered to your door, and it comes in a little glass container and it's cold enough outside that you don't have to bring it in right away, right? But the milk and this is the way it comes out of the cow as well, is uh, in layers, right? You have your cream on top and a very watery mixture of a little bit of protein down at the bottom, right? Okay, so what do we do to the milk to make it more palatable for our cereal or something like that? You'd have to shake it up. You used to have to shake it up and then you could put it on your cereal. Or otherwise, you get all the cream on your cereal, and that's good too, but um, you might not get any cream with the rest of the, the milk. You just get a very, very watery material. Um, so you've taken a heterogeneous mixture of milk, and when you shake it, you turn it into what kind of a mixture? A uh, homogeneous. That's right. It starts off hetero. But as you mix it, you can make it homogeneous or homogeneous. And that's why on the side of the milk, it says homogenized milk, right? Oh, okay. Um, salad dressing, salad dressing. As this salad dressing is kind of shown here, you know, oil and vinegar salad dressing, it's pretty much uh, a heterogeneous mixture, right? You have the oil on top, the vinegar down below, right? Um, that isn't going to be something you're going to want to put on your salad like that, 
you need to shake it up as well to make it a little more homogeneous before you put it on your milk. Here is a mixture of, uh, or for, before you put it on your salad. <laughs> Here's a mixture of uh, some, oh, what do you call it, frosting. Just lots of different colors. Clearly, this is a homogeneous, or sorry, a heterogeneous mixture of those those materials: the green, the red, the blue, the white. All right. Now let's talk about uh, one of the more popular mixtures out there. It's what we breathe all the time: air. Air. Air is okay. a mixture as well. Do you know what's in air? If I blow up a uh, balloon, what's in this air? Nitrogen. I know nitrogen and oxygen. Very good. That's right. Nitrogen and oxygen. And those are the major components. I'm also going to get some carbon dioxide, especially if I'm blowing up this balloon. Um, okay. how, do you know the percentage of nitrogen and oxygen by chance? I don't. Okay. It's about 80% nitrogen and about 20% oxygen. And so when we breathe, we're trying to get the oxygen in our body, right? Um, and you need to get an oxygen concentration. I mean, you know, you need to breathe every few seconds, uh, uh, twenty percent. If you increase that concentration, then um, and you breathe at the same rate, um, it will make you lightheaded, right? Um, and or if you uh, if your lungs aren't working as well, they're not working as efficiently, and they only get a smaller percentage of the oxygen, then you can ramp up this percentage and kind of balance out how well they're working uh, compared to the percentage of oxygen. So you, know, you see older people get the uh, get oxygen for themselves. It increases the percentage of oxygen that goes into their each breath. Therefore, it uh, because their lungs need kind of to have, be compensated for a little bit, right? Okay. So air is a, a very classic example of a mixture. Now, um, have you ever been in... in in certain parts of a room and you say, wow, I don't feel like there's enough oxygen over here. I better go over to that side of the room. Or is it pretty much everywhere you breathe in a room, it feels the same? Yeah. Yeah, the same. Yeah. So what does that tell us about the kind of mixture that air is? Is it so, homogeneous or heterogeneous? Homogeneous. Homogeneous. That's right. Did you have another comment? Um... So oxygen tanks, is that a, still a, a combination of, nit of, of air, of nitrogen and oxygen? It's usually, or, it's usually yeah, it's usually a higher percentage of oxygen, um, and they might have a little bit of nitrogen. I, I'm not sure. They might vary. They, they have the ability to, to vary the concentration of... To vary. Uh, yeah, to I vary see. a lot. Uh, when you scuba dive, right? They have to make sure that they yeah. control the, the amount of nitrogen that you breathe uh, as well. So, right. All right. So, uh, our homogeneous mixtures. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Something else? Well, I was just thinking that uh, when I scuba dive, the, the teacher was really specific saying, okay, it's not an oxygen tank, it's an air tank. And so I guess he was trying to get the point across that it's basically the same air that we breathe as in the the tank, the scuba tank. Yeah. So our milk is our homogenous mixture, uh, if it's shaken up well. Air is a homogenous mixture. But here our salad dressing and our mixture of um, frostings is our, our heterogeneous mixtures. Now, what do you so, think about... Uh, go milk. ahead. Milk is kind of a tricky one, right? Because, uh, because of your example of milk, it, I guess it depends on what form we're talking about, right? If we... That's right. That's if, right. If we pick it up from the grocery store, then it's homogenous, but if we left that same milk uh, in out on the counter, well, in cold places, what, what would make it separate, right? Or well, it's a warm place. A warm place, right? In a cold place, like your fridge, yeah, it'll stay, right. it'll it'll keep from separating for, for, you know, almost two weeks about. Um, but, but you're right, that it will separate pretty good 
if it's just left out of glass is left out. I don't know if you remember finding baby bottles around the house uh, full of separated milk, right? <laughs> so uh, that's can, a good point. Can I get off the subject? Sure, a sure. Uh, what do you think? Is a, a soda, is it what kind of a, um, a situation here? Is it a pure substance, a mixture? Which one? What would you call a soda? Like Coca-Cola there. Uh, yeah, that would be... Uh... Well, it's a mixture. Okay, it's a mixture. How did we know it was a mixture? Because it's uh What's the main component? What do you think? Well, we have uh, water. Water. We have carbonated water. Very good. Water and then the carbonation, carbon dioxide. There's a second substance. So right there, if that's all you knew, you knew it would have to be a, a mixture. Okay. But we got what? We got sugars. They put some salt in, phosphoric acid, citric acid, right? You can read on the side of the bottle there. They got lots of stuff in there. Uh, homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture? The, the, the uh, soda pop. Hom homogeneous. Homogeneous. Very good. Now, to what you were mentioning earlier, the bottom left here, it might be kind of small. I'm not sure if you can see it. But on the bottom left of the slide here, we introduce another term. And it's not a critical term for this class, but uh, it is an interesting term. It's called a, a suspension. A suspension. And what it basically is, is it's what milk is. Milk is a suspension because, as you mentioned, if you let it set for a while, the homogeneity of it will go to a heterogeneous, right? So oh, it's, I see. the suspension is the word for a, a mixture that we've homogenized, but then is going to go back to a heterogeneous mixture uh, gradually. Okay? okay? All right. So we have here a table with uh, four different substances, hot cocoa, ice, white flour, sodium chloride. And we want to kind of think about these. Are they pure substances? Are they elements, compounds, molecules, heterogeneous mixtures, homogeneous mixtures? Well, so what okay. do you think? What do you think? Hot cocoa, what would you think? Is it a pure substance? Uh, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you do I know for sure. Sure, yeah. sure. So, so it's uh, it's gonna be uh, okay. Yeah. So let's go with pure substance. Well, what is in the hot cocoa? What do you think? What's the main thing in hot cocoa? Well, I, you know, I'm actually kind of separating hot after saying cocoa, right? Okay, that's fine. Cocoa. What's what's the so, word? Oh, I, so, 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 so I'm thinking the. Go ahead. Well, I mean, that's that's a that's so a, a that's a fair thought. You know, well, we can think not, about what it's cocoa not an element, is. Right? It's, it's not an it's element. It's not an element, but it is pure, isn't it? Well. How do you get cocoa? Well, it's from the bean. All right. So you take the bean then, and then you what? Right. Grind it up? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you take that bean and you plant it, what would happen to it? It would grow. It would grow. It would grow into a tree. So essentially, right. it's a, a, a baby organism. It has in it. Uh, proteins, it has DNA, it has uh, sugars so that the, the, the small protein or the small germ could grow from it, from that seed. It has salts, it has all sorts of you know hormones, just like a little tiny person, if you will, right? It's, it's an organism. So surely there's right. not just one kind of thing there, right? There's lots of different things. So it's, oh, gotcha. it's not going to okay. be a pure substance. And like you mentioned, it's not going to be an element. And right. it's not going to be just one compound and just one molecule. So it's got to be a mixture of some sort, right? right. And okay. depending on whether you have your hot cocoa, I mean, hot cocoa to me is a, a little a little mug with some marshmallows floating around. So, you know, it'd right. have to be a mixture of some sort. Uh, whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous would kind of be depend on when we last shook it or something like that. 
Oh, I see. Right, right. Okay, let's do ice here. What do you think? Ice, which is just okay. water. Okay. Um, is it an element? So it's a, it's a mixture of elements. It's, it's a mixture of elements. I mean, it's a, it's a compound of elements. It's a compound of elements, yeah. It's, it's interesting how we have to be careful about what we say, because it's true. In English, yeah. you say, yeah. we're mixing these elements together, but we don't want to confuse right. people into thinking that it's a, it's a mixture. So it's kind of an right. interesting thing there. So yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. a compound. Very good. Right. Do you know if it's a molecular compound? Is it a molecule? Should we bring in the periodic it's table? A, uh... It would be a molecular. Yeah, because hydrogen's a nonmetal and oxygen's a nonmetal. Good. Very good. Okay, so it's a, a, a compound, a molecule, and it, it must be a pure substance then too, right? Because right. that's the definition of a pure substance, either a compound or a mo uh, sorry, uh, a compound or an element. So because it's a compound, it's it's going to be a, okay. a pure substance. All right. What about white flour? What do you think? Okay. So so it's uh, it would be a mixture. Yeah, it has to be a mixture because what? How do you get white flour? Uh, you have to bleach it. Well, it's wheat. Yeah, it's wheat, right? It's, it's, it's wheat. Right. And so you're crushing this organism, which has all the different things that a person has in it, basically. Crushing it up, right. and you're making a, a powder of this material. So you you got right. DNA, you got protein, you got all sorts of salts and sugars. So it's a mixture. And whether it be homogeneous or heterogeneous, I think that most people would say that white flour is homogeneous, don't you think? Right. So, um, with the cocoa, yeah, and the uh, and the flour, right? We were talking about the cocoa bean. So anything that uh, pretty much grows in nature, right? Any, yeah. Any, uh, is is uh, is considered a. Uh, mixture already, right? Right. It's got to be a mixture because there's lots of different compounds in any... Because of the DNA, right? Yeah. In any right. living organism... Is that is, what's... Okay. Well, there's lots. There's not just DNA, right? There's, there's right, right. all sorts of hormones. There's all sorts of small molecule, uh, signaling messenger molecules, you know, just all sorts of stuff. Just like any living organism oh, okay. has, right? I mean, imagine if I took a drop of my blood, I'd have hundreds of chemicals in that one drop, right? Um, and if I took a person <laughs> and ground them up into a mush or whatever, there's so many different kinds of chemicals that would be there, right? So clearly it would have to be a mixture if you take an organism like wheat and, and grind it up. Yeah, and you know, that's an interesting story behind that. People were asked, in general, do you think it's important to label the products as uh, genetically modified if, if if there's a food that's genetically modified do you think it's important to label those foods as genetically modified and it was about um 55 percent of the people said yes they thought that that was important i think you've heard this before but um oh, I don't but recall. they asked the same people a follow-up question to kind of test where their level of understanding was and they said, do you think if your food contains deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA, that there should be a label that says this food contains DNA? And even more people, about 60% said, yeah, if it contains DNA, you have to put that on the label. And so, um, you know, there isn't really much food that we eat that doesn't contain DNA, right? We're getting all our food from either plants or animals generally. Um, you might purify away the oil or the sugar from a plant, and so then you're just having straight sugar or pure oil. But in general, um, our sources of food will always contain DNA. So just a, a realization that you know, living organisms are complex with lots of different compounds in them. 
All so, right. Yeah, go ahead. That, so concerning blood, right, I've always heard that blood is a high percentage of water. What do you think? What about sodium chloride? Okay, okay sodium chloride is a... Man, he's always throwing me now. It's a... Is it an element? Okay, it's it's a... So we know this is salt. Yeah. Well. And. Uh, yeah. Right. It's yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a uh, it's gonna be a molecular uh, compound. Well, let's look here. Where is sodium and where is chlorine? Can you find it? If we look in close Plus. here. It looks like sodium okay. is number 11 here. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, sodium's a metal. Huh? Uh-huh. And chlorine over here is a non-metal. So right. So it's an ionic... Uh... Ionic compound. Good. Yeah. So it is a compound. Uh oh. Very good. It's... Oh, okay. Sodium's a metal. I... Yeah. So it's, okay. it's not a molecule. It is a compound. because It's not a molecule because it's yeah. ionic. Um, is it? It's not yeah. an element because it contains two elements, right? Um, uh, is it a pure substance? So as far as the, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so salt we decided is a compound. It's not an element, um, and we decided it must be a pure substance, right? Because pure substances are either compounds or elements. Now, we decided what? Is it molecular or is it ionic? It's ionic. Ionic, because it contains sodium, which is a metal. Good. Any questions so, about that? And, yeah, uh, pure substance because, I mean, I know we, we mine salt, but is, well, is, what's, what dictates up in a pure substance? Well, anytime you have a, a, a material... And if everything, so here's maybe a pile of sodium chloride, right? Okay. It's on a dish or whatever. Everything in here has that exact same formula, NaCl. And it's organized in the exact same way. And so that's the definition of, oh, a, yes. of a pure substance. Okay. Right? Right, right. Okay, good. All right. Now, we're going to introduce to us uh, a couple of what we call laws of chemistry, some of the laws of chemistry. And one of the first laws is the law of conservation of mass, conservation of mass. In a chemical reaction, <clears throat> the mass of the starting materials will always equal the mass of the products. Um, you know, early on, this wasn't self-evident. They thought that you were losing or creating mass when you grew a tree, for example, or if you burned a tree down, they thought the mass just disappeared because they weren't collecting the carbon dioxide that was going away. Or when a seed turned into a huge tree, they thought you were making mass because they weren't measuring the carbon dioxide that was being collected from the environment, right, from the surroundings. <coughs> but chemistry, uh, you don't have any... Uh, radioactive processes that change the amount of mass that is in a, um, a system. And so if I have a chemical reaction, whatever it is, A plus B, these are, again, our reactants, left side, products, whatever our products are. If I know I start with uh, two grams of my reactants here, I'm going to end with two grams of my products. All right. Assuming that everything okay. is consumed here, uh, the law of the conservation of mass uh, says that that the mass doesn't go anywhere. All right. And you can think about that maybe okay. in the form of making sandwiches. You put different things on the sandwiches. Okay. In the end, you know you have the same material. You haven't gained or lost material. Another okay. example here is. Uh, if you take two 
chemicals, but separate them. So here we have one inside the test tube, one on the outside of the test tube, but in the flask. Mix them like this, they'll have the same mass. Even after the chemical reaction occurs, the, the same mass will be around. All right, uh, let me write another chemical reaction. Uh, very familiar one here, where we have uh, hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas coming together to form water, right? So, for example, if I have one gram of hydrogen and eight grams of oxygen, it'll come together to form nine grams of water. All right? Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> how many hydrogens are on this side of the equation? Uh, just two. Just two. That's right. So if we... We do our little counting thing here. Two hydrogens. How many oxygens on the right side? One. One. How about over here? How many hydrogens are on the left side? Uh, two. Two hydrogens. But how many oxygens are on the left side? Two. Two. So you can see how I've written this right here. It's not a balanced equation, right? And so we'd have to fix right. that. We'd have to fix that by making more oxygen on the right side. And okay. the only way we can do that is we can't put another number down here because that makes a different chemical, right? The only way we can fix that is by putting a coefficient in here and making and say, let's have two water molecules be products. But when we do that, it changes the number of hydrogens and oxygens, right? Now we have how many oxygens? We have two oxygens uh -huh. and four hydrogens. Four hydrogens, that's right. So we're still not balanced. We have four and two here and only two and two over here. But we can change it. We can balance that. How can we balance that? What do we need more of over here? We need more hydrogen. That's right. We need twice as many, right? Yeah. So I can put a two a coefficient in front of there, and that'll make okay. that four now. Right? Right. So there's our balanced equation. Now, this is the balanced equation, but this is the information in terms of mass. One gram of hydrogen combines with eight grams of oxygen to form nine grams of water, all right? So what we're recognizing here is two of these, one of these, and two of these. But those numbers, two, one, and two, aren't in terms of, of mass, right? Aren't in terms of mass of that material. And we'll talk about that in the upcoming chapters. But um, we have to begin to recognize that the coefficients here can change, but that doesn't change the resulting uh, masses that are combined or the uh, mass of the product, right? And the law of conservation of mass will still be, still be the mass of the reactants will equal the mass of the products. Okay. Okay. Good job. So, uh, here is a, a question for us. Magnesium burns in oxygen, whoops, magnesium burns in oxygen to form magnesium oxide. All right. So, in this problem here, we have uh, magnesium burning in the presence of oxygen to form a compound magnesium oxide, magnesium oxide. <coughs> so um, if 16.88 grams of magnesium are consumed, so that's our magnesium, 16.88 grams, okay. and 28 grams of magnesium oxide are produced, that's our product, what mass of oxygen 
was consumed in the process. So, let me write that here as well. We have magnesium, and we have apparently 16.88 grams of it. And it's combining with some oxygen. We don't know how many grams, but the result is 28 grams of magnesium oxide. So how can we find out how many oh, grams of that stuff there is? We would uh, subtract uh, the 16.88 from the 28. That's right. 16.88 from the 28, and that would give us the mass of oxygen. All right, very good. <coughs> Another law that we're going to talk about is the law of, of definite proportions. The law of definite proportions. And this basically says that, as this diagram is showing, if I have, for example, 9 grams of water, and I break it up into hydrogen and oxygen, I'm always going to get uh, a 1 gram of hydrogen and an 8 gram of oxygen ratio. So if I take twice as much water, I'm going to get twice as much hydrogen, 2 grams of hydrogen and 16 grams of oxygen. I'm not going to get, if I take 18 grams of water, there's no way I'm going to get uh, 16 grams of hydrogen this time and, and 2 grams of oxygen, right? The, right. law, the law of definite proportions, and that's what this law is saying, is that <coughs> because compounds come together in a fixed way, then they'll always have the same proportions of the different elements within that compound. All right. Another way of, of thinking about this is if I have um, just any old chemical reaction, let's say A combining with B, and let's say, under these conditions, when I combine A to B, it looks like this. There's two A's coming together with each B. Well, <coughs> if I put, uh, I'd have to put two A's in there then, right? If I put three A's and combined it with a B, and I formed A to B, I would just be left with another A. I wouldn't form A3B simply because I put more A in. I would just have A left over. All right? Okay. Another way of showing the law of, of definite proportions. Okay? Now, it is possible for reactions to occur in different conditions and form different products. But if, and those are, that's called the law of multiple proportions, and we'll introduce that in a bit. But if it's only possible to form A to B, then even though you have more A, you're not going to form a different compound. You're just going to have leftover A. Okay. All right. Good. So, in this problem here, in this question here, we're told a sample of magnesium oxide has 16.89 grams of magnesium and 11.11 .11 grams of oxygen. And then the question is, what mass of oxygen would there be in a sample that contains 2 grams of magnesium? So if I have a sample of magnesium oxide, let's draw a picture here. I have a sample of magnesium oxide, there it is, and it contains 16.89 grams of magnesium and 11.11 .11 grams of oxygen. And then it's saying if I have another sample over here, <clears throat> apparently this sample's smaller because it says it only has 2 grams of magnesium. And they're asking us how many grams, whoop, not at zero, but how many X grams of oxygen are there? How many grams of oxygen are there if there's only two grams of magnesium in this compound? 
Well, both both compounds are are the same, right? Right. They're both magnesium oxide. So because right. they're both magnesium oxide, the ratio of magnesium to oxygen should be the same. You follow right. that? And that's what it's asking, right? What the ratio is? Well, it's asking us specifically how much oxygen is in this smaller sample. Right. But we can figure that out right. by setting up that ratio and saying 16.89 grams of magnesium for every 11.11 .11 grams of oxygen, right? And that has to be equal right. to our other sample that only has 2 grams of magnesium and some unknown amount a mass of, of oxygen. Okay, so we can uh, solve this problem. 16.89 grams of magnesium uh, <clears throat> over 11.11 .11 grams of oxygen by cross multiplying. Do you remember cross multiplying okay. from math? Yes. All right. So 2 times 11.11 will have to be equal to 16.89 times x. Then we divide both of these by 16.89. Whoops, 9. That'll give us x on one side. And then we put that in our calculator here. 2 times 11.11 .11 divided by 16.89. Did I do that right? Yeah. So 1.31. 1.31. And that is grams of oxygen. Okay, and we were able to answer that because of our... Um, What's it called? Our law of definite proportions. We knew that they were both magnesium oxide, therefore the ratio of mag magnesium to oxygen had to be the same. Could you uh, go through the cross multiplication?